to turn to 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's page 1944. Yeah, Anybody else need a Bible? Second Thessalonians chapter 2 then. I'm reading from verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed, either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay, with the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence, so that they may believe what is false, in order that they may all be judged, who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. We have been looking at some of the events, some of the characteristics of the last days in the world and in the church, and I want us to think about one particular thing that we are told to watch out for as a sure sign that we are indeed in the last days. There is a man that is to come. He is given various titles in the Bible, one or two of which are in this passage. He is called the man of lawlessness, a nomia, a nomia, without law, without instruction. He's the man of lawlessness. He's the son of perdition, the son of destruction. He is the beast of revelation. He is various things. And he is yet to come. I personally believe that he is probably alive today and waiting in the wings. And there is a mystery of lawlessness at work. It's been at work since the early church, right through 
But this mystery of lawlessness is at work preparing the way for the man of lawlessness. So there is an antichrist spirit. The Bible says many antichrists will come. And each antichrist teaches us something about the ultimate antichrist. Does that make sense? And the spirit of antichrist is preparing the way for the antichrist. So the Holy Spirit is preparing the bride of Christ for the return of Jesus. And the spirit of lawlessness, <coughs> the mystery of lawlessness, the spirit of antichrist is preparing the apostate church for the man of lawlessness, the antichrist. And so we need to understand these two different things, this mystery of lawlessness, which is at work. <clears throat> when Jesus warned in the Sermon on the Mount that many would come on the day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do many mighty works in your name? And he said, I will have to say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Lawlessness. Anomia. You were lawless. You were without law. You rejected the law of God. Depart from me. I never knew you. We need to understand something very, very simply. You cannot reject the word of God <coughs> and love Jesus Christ. He is the word that was made flesh <coughs> and dwelt among us. The word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and as many as receive him, to them he gave authority, right, to be the sons of God, to all who believe in his name. When we put our trust in Jesus, dear friends, we become lovers of the word. Lovers of the word. We cannot separate Scripture from Jesus. He is the Word. If we love Jesus, we love the Word of God. You can't say, well, I love Jesus, but I never bother reading my Bible. You can't say, I love Jesus, but I don't accept everything in the Scriptures. You cannot say it's a contradiction. Let's look at one or two scriptures. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Should be familiar. What did Jesus say? I am the, the way and the, and the truth and the life. Jesus is the truth. He is the word of God. And in John chapter 17... When he was praying for the disciples and for the church. John 17 verse 17 he says sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus prayed that those who would put their trust in him and receive him would be sanctified. Set apart to what? The truth. And what is the truth? Thy word is truth, dear friends. The mystery of lawlessness, anomia, is dragging people away from the truth, the word of God. It is deceiving them into believing that somehow you can love Jesus without loving 
the Word of God. You cannot. He is the Word of God. He is the truth. Thy Word is truth. You reject the Word of God. You reject Jesus. It's that simple and it's that serious. I was watching <coughs> something the other day. It was, I don't know if it was Christian Institute or whatever. Anyway. It, and it had the um, Archbishop of York. And he was supposed to be this evangelical, born again, true Christian. And yet he stood there and basically said, we don't need the Word, because the Word was made flesh. And so, we're flesh. The Church has the same authority, do you understand? The Word was made flesh, and so the authority is now in flesh. So we can decide. We can make up our minds which way we go. We don't have to reject homosexuality because the Bible rejects it. Because the word has been made flesh now. And this was the great hope of evangelicals in the Church of England. The man's a buffoon. He's deceived. He's in darkness. He's standing and saying that he loves Jesus, but he doesn't love the word of God. It's the mystery of lawlessness, dear friends. And that mystery of lawlessness is an antichrist spirit which is preparing the false church for the antichrist. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. The Holy Spirit will lead us back to the word of God every time. The anointing teaches us. We all have an anointing of the Holy Spirit as believers in Christ. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. When we read the Word of God, He is able to minister the truth of God's Word to our hearts. The Holy Spirit is preparing the Bride of Christ, opening the, the Word of God, giving us a love of the truth, but the Antichrist spirit is causing so-called believers to depart and is preparing them to receive the man of lawlessness. Let's read one more scripture. Philippians and chapter 1. Well, we need to be loving, don't we? You'll hear that more and more. Oh, you just don't, you're not loving enough. No, it's not about what the Bible says. But we just need to love people. We need to love everybody. We need to love homosexuals. No, we need to abhor that which is evil. And cling to that which is good. The fear of the Lord is to hate iniquity. When we don't hate iniquity, we don't fear God. It's a sure sign that there is no reverence of God in a person when we don't hate iniquity. Philippians chapter 1 and from verse 8. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. The same love that is in Jesus. And this I pray with the same love that is in Jesus. Well, what did Jesus pray? That believers be <coughs> sanctified in the truth. Well, Paul following suit says this, This I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment. What kind of love is it that is not grounded in knowledge of the truth and real discernment. It's not the love of God, dear friends. Simple as that. Simple as that. 
It might be nice and woolly and fluffy and warm, but it's not the love of God. The love that drew salvation's plan and brought it down to man. True love rejoices in the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Oh, well, you know, we, you, you're just in the, all the Bible. We're all about love. Well, love rejoices in the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't it? Well, is your love rejoicing in the truth? Thy word is truth. We cannot separate love from truth. But the spirit of lawlessness will. Preparing for the Antichrist. And leading the apostasy. What else? He's called the son of perdition. He's called the son of perdition. The son of destruction. <coughs> <clears throat> Who else was called the son of perdition? You're allowed to answer. <laughs> Judas. Judas is the son of perdition, wasn't he? He was the son of perdition. What characteristics do we see in Judas that we can watch out for in the man of lawlessness? Number one, he was personally possessed by who? Satan. Satan entered into Judas, the scripture says. Satan entered into Judas. The Antichrist will be personally possessed not just by demons but by Satan himself. By Satan himself. What else? Judas had the money bag. And he had a seeming concern for the poor. Humanitarian. Hmm? Mother Teresa with trousers. <clears throat> But he was a thief. He was a thief. He had covetousness in his heart. That will characterise the Antichrist. It will also characterise the Antichrist spirit preparing the apostate church. A person's attitude in dealing with money is a key giveaway to whether they are true or false. You cannot serve God and <coughs> mammon. If all you're ever thinking about and talking about is money, you are despising God. Full stop. Don't argue. <coughs> Jesus said so. What else? He went out and betrayed Jesus. He went out and betrayed Jesus. He was among the disciples. He appeared to be one of them. When Jesus said, someone is going to betray me, they didn't all say, ah, it must be Judas. No. They said, is it me? Is it me? Nobody suspected this one. This one. And he went out. He was in the midst of them. Dear friends, that Antichrist spirit is at work in the church. Judas is alive and well. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. Page 2025. Page 2025. 1 John 2 verses 18 and 19. Children. It is the last hour, has been since the day of Pentecost. The last days in the scripture is the whole of the church age. We are in the last days. The church has always been in the last days, do you understand? But we are in the last of the last days. It is the last hour and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists, have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have remained with us. 
but they went out in order that it might be shown that they all are not of us. Judas went out from the disciples. The Antichrist, watch out, because he's going to be very convincing. He will be very convincing. So he's the man of lawlessness, there's the spirit of lawlessness, he's the son of perdition. <clears throat> what else? Turn to the book of Revelation and chapter 13. We'll look at one or two types and what they teach us. What else is the Antichrist going to do? Revelation 13 verse 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb he spoke as a dragon he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed he performs great signs so, uh, so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And there was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast might speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. There will be an image set up. Babylon, who did it? Nebuchadnezzar. You had to bow down and worship the image. And if you didn't, you would be killed. Nothing new under the sun, is there? Well, it's going to be outplayed again. And who wouldn't bow down? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mikael. They wouldn't bow down. They said, God's able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, <laughs> We're not going to bow down. And that needs to be our attitude, dear friends. We will not bow down. We're not going to bow down. You can tell us to shut up, but we'll not shut up. God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, <coughs> we won't do it. There are certain things, dear friends, we are told to bow to authorities, but there are certain things that there's a line drawn. Number one, they can't tell you to stop preaching the gospel. You must keep preaching the gospel. Okay? The apostles said we must obey God rather than men. When they were told to stop preaching the gospel, there was civil disobedience. You can't do it. When Daniel was told to stop praying, you can't do it. When these three men were told to bow to an image, idolatry, you can't do it. Okay? Most of the laws, it's negotiable. You should submit to authorities. But there are certain lines you can't cross. You can't tell people that you won't preach the gospel. You can't stop talking about Jesus. You can't stop praying. And you cannot bow down or worship anyone else other than the Lord himself. So if anyone tells you you have to go into a temple and take your shoes off or bow down to this thing or that thing, I will worship Jesus and Jesus alone. And I'm not going to. You can do what you want, you can put me in the fire, but I'm not going to bow down. You understand, there are certain lines 
not to be crossed. You can tell me to stop talking about Jesus, but I'm not going to. Whatever it costs me, it doesn't matter. I must obey God rather than men. Okay? Where do we get to? <clears throat> so, they have to worship the image. See that there's another beast who is pointing people to worship the Antichrist. That's the satanic trinity. Yeah? Satan is personally inside the Antichrist. He's always wanted to be as God, hasn't he? He's always wanted to be worshipped. Yeah? Well, God becomes a man, the word becomes flesh, and he is the one that we are to worship. Okay? So, Satan has his version of this. And the Holy Spirit points people to Jesus. The Holy Spirit points believers that they must worship and glorify Jesus. Okay? This beast points people to worship the Antichrist. You get the picture? Okay. And there was given to him breath. We've read that. Verse 16, he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark, on their right hand or on their forehead. He provides that no one should be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man. It's the number of man, quite, quite literally, it's the number of man. Six is the number of man. Man was made on day six, he was told to work for six days. It's the number six, yeah? It's the number of man. His number is six, six, six. The number of man, six, six, Six. The image that Nebuchadnezzar set up was how tall? Sixty and six. Six, six. Consistent. Throughout scripture are these pictures of Antichrist. He's worshipped as God and receives worship. Who did that in the book of Acts? A man called Herod. One of the Herods. There's a number of Herods in Scripture. Herod, the voice of a God and not a man. And they worshipped him. And he received worship. Was God pleased? No, he wasn't. God struck him dead and he was eaten by worms. What's going to happen to the Antichrist? He's going to be cast into the lake of fire. He's going to be chewed by worms for all eternity. Don't go to the lake of fire if you don't want to be chewed by worms. Because that's what's going to happen. Hell hath opened its mouth for you, the king of Babylon. Worms are going to eat you. Herod was a type of Antichrist. And what was he doing? He was controlling the supply of food in the Middle East. Interesting. Watch out for an antichrist that's got control of food in the Middle East. What other types do we have? Judas, we've got Herod. <clears throat> Goliath. A lot of sixes in the story of Goliath. So there's things to be learned. You know, his whole family. Are all sixes, aren't they? They've got six toes and six fingers, and his his um, what was it? His um, his spear was six hundred shekels, and all the six hundred. When you see six hundreds and sixes, it's pointing us and teaching us something about the man of lawlessness and the mystery of lawlessness. The mystery of lawlessness has no problem with worshiping man. 
you understand? False teachers, false anointed ones, false prophets. The mystery of lawlessness will quite happily encourage the worship of a man. <coughs> Dear friends, the Spirit of God will point blank, block you from raising up any man other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Do you understand? Goliath, who else? Come on, we've done this before, someone should. Solomon. Solomon, thank you. Let's look at Solomon then. Turn to 1 Kings and chapter 10. 1 Kings and chapter 10. I want to just pick up a few things. Page 571, 1 Kings chapter 10, Solomon becomes a picture of Antichrist. What did he do? Well, God gave him wisdom, didn't he? But he turned from the Lord, and he became an idolater. He became a worshipper of foreign gods because of all his foreign wives. <clears throat> he turned away. Let's just look at that. Chapter 11, verse 9 says, Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. What did he do? He turned away, he rebelled, he was an apostate. The apostasy must come, the man of lawlessness, the mystery of lawlessness already at work will cause many to turn away their hearts from following the Lord. Those who do not receive a love of the truth. So back to chapter 10 verse 1. Now, when the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with difficult questions. So she came to Jerusalem with a very large retinue with camels carrying spices and very much gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. And Solomon answered all the questions. Nothing was hidden from the king which he did not explain to her. When the queen of Sheba perceived all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his servants, and their attire, his cupbearers, and his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. She was gobsmacked. He took her breath away, as we would say. <clears throat> and verse 14, Now the weight of gold which came into Solomon in one year was six, six, six. Where's six, six, six in the Bible? Here it is, 1 Kings chapter 10. The story of the Queen of Sheba. She comes to Solomon. She's very impressed with him, especially because he's the one who's built a temple in Jerusalem. Is there going to be the rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem in the last days, dear friends? Yes, yes there is. And who's going to be behind it? Very likely to be the Antichrist. Very likely to be the Antichrist. Now we are, to a certain degree, making doctrine from types, which you've got to be careful about, but it certainly fits. Herod, another type of Antichrist, <coughs> was instrumental in Herod's temple, Solomon, built the temple in Jerusalem, and there must be a temple 
rebuilt in Jerusalem. <coughs> Why? Because Jesus said that the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, <coughs> will set up the abomination of desolation in the temple. Let the reader understand. So there must be a temple in Jerusalem. When we see plans, when we see efforts to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem, it is a sign that we are living in the last days. Is that happening? <coughs> oh yes it is. They've got it all planned out. There's just one or two things that need to fall into place. And it's going to take a very powerful world leader to pull that thing together. Well, who will that be? Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. A man who will have wisdom from Satan himself, will be personally possessed by Satan himself. <clears throat> And will be instrumental. He'll, he'll be involved in some way with the rebuilding of this temple. Ready to set up the abomination of desolation because he wants to be worshipped as God and exalted as God. He impresses the Queen of Sheba, this Gentile woman. And then we get 666. You see the pattern? Okay. So what was she so impressed about? We have eight things. His wisdom, his house, his food, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his servants, the clothing of his servants, the cupbearers, and the way of approach to the house of the Lord. His way of approach to the house of the Lord. I want to run through those because they're important for us. We need to be impressed with the right thing. The man of lawless, the mystery of lawlessness, is preparing the apostate church for the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit will prepare the bride of Christ for the return of Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit will get us to focus on the right things and the mystery of lawlessness will lead people to focus on the wrong things. Are you following me? Okay. So let's take these one by one. Wisdom. <clears throat> Do not be impressed with people's wisdom. Do not be impressed with people's wisdom. We need to be impressed with the wisdom which comes from a book. <coughs> Turn to James chapter 3. Page 2000, James chapter 3. And reading from verse 13. It says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behaviour his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. It's earthly, natural, and demonic. When you see people with ambition, dear friends, it's demonic. You say, shouldn't we have ambition? What should be our ambition, dear friends? 2 Corinthians says we should have an ambition to please Jesus. That should be your ambition. You've got an ambition for a great career or a, a great name in this world, to have a few letters behind your name, to, to have people looking up to you. You know what that is? That wisdom is demonic. That's demonic wisdom. Sorry if I've trampled on a few toes, but... That's what the Word of God says. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. Well, how do we recognize the wisdom which comes down from above? 
The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy, no act, no act. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The Antichrist is going to come with great wisdom, but it will not be wisdom from above. And it will impress all those who don't understand true wisdom. We need to value God's wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of, of God. And let him not ask doubting, because he who doubts is like the tossing sea. What else impresses her? His house. <laughs> he spent 13 years building it. The number 13 represents rebellion. He spent nearly twice as long building his own house as he did building the house of the Lord. Says a lot, doesn't it? Hmm. The prophet Haggai comes and rebukes the people of God. Because they're more bothered about their own houses than they are about God's house. Well, Solomon was really bothered about his own house. Big mistake. There's one house, dear friends, that we should be bothered about. God's house. It's a beautiful house. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, page 2009. 1 Peter... Chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, You also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. <coughs> God is building a house, and this house is made up of living stones. If you're born again, you are a living stone. Okay? And you are being built up into a spiritual house. God is taking the weak and the foolish and the morons out of the world. And he's building them into a house. He is purchasing with his own blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and dear friends today in the world. There is a house snatched out from every nation and tribe and tongue and people bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ and the world thinks what a ramshackle mess that is and God says it's beautiful. It is a spiritual house which is worshipping Jesus which is thanking him for Calvary which is rejoicing in being cleansed with his precious blood. It's beautiful, dear friends. It's a spiritual house, and you should be thankful to be part of it. <coughs> Don't be impressed with buildings. Don't be impressed with anything that man builds, dear friends. Rejoice that God is building a house himself from every tribe and tongue and nation. And one day, we'll all meet together when we all get together, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and we'll shout the victory. And, and the, the, there'll be harmonies from Africa. And, and, and what a beautiful sound it will be. Dear friends, it'll be a house, a spiritual house. Filled with thanksgiving. Filled with rejoicing. Filled with praise to the Lamb. What a house, dear friends. Let's rejoice in the house that God's building. Amen? Amen. Amen. They were impressed with the food on his table. Dear friends, are you thankful that God will give you daily bread? Give us for the day our daily bread. Are you asking him, dear friends? Every day. 
Are you getting up in the morning? Or if you work in nights, getting up whenever you get up. <laughs> and are you coming to the Lord and ask Him for your daily bread? Are you getting your Bible out and meditating upon the Word of God because there is food? He has prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies and He lavishes it, dear friends, with spiritual food. And we need to turn up with knife and fork at the ready and feed upon the word of God, dear friends. <coughs> we need to be impressed and we need to love God's word. Maybe you've gone cold. Ask God, dear friends, for a fresh love for the word of God, for the scriptures. It'll give you a burning passion to daily come and read the word and meditate upon the word and be built up and, and stirred up by what he opens to you. He'll feed you according to your eating. That's how he fed the children manna in the wilderness, dear friends. How hungry are you for Jesus? Because he'll satisfy you with good things. What else? The seating of his servants. The seating of his servants, dear friends. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I don't know if we read this already, but... Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You were a walking corpse. Spiritually dead. The best you could do was live a soulish life. Remember? We're body, soul and spirit and our spirit was dead. The best that you could do was live according to your passions and desires. Because you were spiritually dead in your trespasses and sins. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience among them. We too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And what did that make us? We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We were enemies of God, living by what we wanted. What we felt, what we thought. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved, that even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive. Hallelujah. Are you born again? Because except a man be born again, he will not enter, dear friends. You're still dead in trespasses and sins. You need to be made Alive, you need to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit and raised us up, raised us up with Him and seated us where with Him where in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're impressed with where someone sat. Speaker of the house got a nice big posh chair, hasn't he? What an idiot he was. We need to be impressed with our seating, dear friends, because God has seated us in heavenly places with Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and now we've been made alive spiritually. We can commune with him. We can boldly approach the throne of His grace because He's cleansed us by His precious blood and made us priests. What an amazing thing, dear friends. What a seating we have. What a position we have in Christ. What has this world got to offer you when God has put you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? We need to remember that. She was impressed with the attendance of his servants. There's going to be a lot of people scuttling around the Antichrist. 
Turn to Luke chapter 22. And they'll all be nestling in for a position and a title, no doubt. Page 1701, Luke chapter 22, and I'll read from verse 24. There arose also a dispute among them. What starts more disputes among believers than anything else? Hmm? As to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest? <coughs> Who's bestest? Mm -hmm. I'm bestest than you. Who's more important? Mm -hmm. Who's top of the tree? It causes nothing but trouble, that spirit and that way of thinking. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. That's how the world works. You work your way up. You make it to the top. But dear friends, we're already at the top. He has already seated us with Christ in heavenly places. Where do you want to go from there? You can only go down, can't you? We don't have to work our way up to anything. We don't have to force our way into anything. It's not so among you. But let him who is the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the servant. For who is greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I'm among you as the one who serves. And you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Have this mind, have this attitude which was in Christ Jesus. What did he do? He emptied himself. He took the form of a servant, a bond slave of, G of, of God. And he emptied himself and he served. And he was obedient to death on the cross. And now God has highly exalted him. And Jesus is saying, follow my pardon. Follow what I've done. There's a kingdom which is coming. You're going to rule and you're going to reign. And it's all down to how much you humble yourself, how much you empty yourself, and take the form of a servant. You want to be great in God's kingdom? Be the servant <coughs> of all. Amen? You take that attitude, dear friends, because the mystery of lawlessness will be taking people in the opposite direction. The apostate church will be all about exalting people. And so we need to humble ourselves. What else? The clothing of his servants. You need to clothe yourself with humility. Put on the mantle of humility. You need to wear the whole armour of God that he has given you so that you can stand and having done all that you can stand. But praise God dear friends for he has clothed us with garments of salvation. He has robed us with a robe of righteousness. Praise God when we meet him will be dressed in white. The saints will be dressed in white. You don't have to worry about what clothes you're going to be raptured in or anything like that. God's going to dress you. And he already has. Praise God. So stop worrying about what you look like. Amen? Vanity of vanities, said the preacher. 
All is vanity. And isn't this generation and this world more and more consumed with looks? Well, so is the apostate church. But the people of God, dear friends, know how God has dressed them. I know what it's important to wear. We need to be dressed in humility. One last thing. No, oh, sorry, two, two last things. Cup bearers. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He sweat as it were drops of blood. And he said, if this cup can pass from me, yet not my will, but thy will be <coughs> done. If any man come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We need to deny <coughs> self and we need to do the will of God. That's what it means to take up your cross. To be a cupbearer. Not my will. Not what I want today. Not what I want this week. I want to sit down and put my feet up. I want to rest. Not my will, but thy will be done. May I deny myself. May I take up my cross. And may I do the will of God. May I do. This is eternal life. That we go on doing his will. One last thing. The ascent to the house of God. The ascent to the house of God. The burnt offering by which he approached the house of God. Dear friends, there's an offering by which we get in to God's house. It was called Calvary. The Son of God himself bore our sins in his own body. They beat him, they spat on him, they mocked him, they dressed him in a purple robe, they, they, they led him out, they fastened a piece of wood to him, they paraded him through the streets, they, they did everything to him. And then God caused darkness to fall, so that no one saw that he was mad beyond any man. Dear friends, I believe Jesus went through things that we, we may not know. We cannot tell what pains he had to bear. But dear friends, it was for us that he hung and he suffered there. And let him who boasts, <laughs> boast in the cross. Boast in the sacrifice of Jesus in our place. Amen. Amen. May God stir these things in our hearts because these truths, dear friends, will sit in opposition when opened by the Holy Spirit will cause us to worship Jesus when the mystery of lawlessness, dear friends, will take people in a different direction and prepare the apostate church for the Antichrist. May God give us understanding in these things. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. I just ask, Heavenly Father, if there's anything that I've said this morning which has not been clear uh, in any way to the word of God, I pray that you will continue by your spirit to grant understanding and wisdom and, and to lead people into all truth so that we understand the things which are important for us in these coming days. Lord, just cement these lessons within our hearts, Lord, so that we might be true worshippers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask in his precious name. Amen. Amen.